Factor investing has been at the core of this YouTube channel. Most of what we talk about and most of the research that we do is based on this idea of factor investing. But let's stop for a second and actually answer the question. What the heck is factor investing? It may seem like a very simple question to ask, but the devil is in the details. In fact, there are videos from prominent YouTube channels that deeply misconstrue what factor investing is all about. And I can't stand for that. So in this video, I want to go over what factor investing is, what it isn't, and whether it's something investors should even consider. In the 2011 movie Moneyball, Peter Brand, played by Jonah Hill, along with general manager of the Oakland A's, Billy Bean, played by Brad Pitt, carry out the task of drafting a playoff team with an extremely tight budget. Instead of relying on intuition and wits, Brand applies statistics, in this case sabermetrics, in order to assemble a solid baseball team. And factor investing is similar to what Peter Brand does in this movie. It utilizes statistics in order to form portfolios that can have higher likelihood to beat the market while foregoing the idea that intuition and discretion has anything of value to add to portfolio construction. It does so by asking one important question. What explains stock returns? Within an efficient market framework, the answer should be pretty simple. Risk. By taking on risk, investors forego short-term safety in the hopes of earning future returns. And it stands to reason that if one wants higher returns, then one should take on more risk. And in the 1960s, William Sharp, Jack Trainer, and John Littner built upon Harry Markowitz's work to come up with a model that attempted to explain what actually drives stock returns. This brought about one of the most foundational models in financial economics, the Capital Asset Pricing Model, or CAPM for short. The CAPM models an asset sensitivity to the market as a proxy for risk. As good as the CAPM model was at the time of release, this model could not explain part of what drove stock returns. And that's when factor investing as we know it today was born. In the 1992 paper, The Cross-Section of Expected Returns, Eugene Fama and Kenneth French established the groundwork for the Fama French three-factor model, where they find that too easily measure variables size, and book-to-market equity combined to capture the cross-sectional variation in average stock returns. Here's Alpha Architect co-CIO Jack Vogel explaining how this paper revolutionized the way quantitative investors would understand portfolio construction. So Fama and French in the paper and research highlighted that while a one-factor model that only includes market beta can explain around two-thirds of the cross-section of stock returns, by simply adding two other factors, specifically size and value, this new three-factor model, the market, size, and value, can explain around 90% of all stock return movement. Now, this does not mean that there's a free lunch. Fahm and French, who are proponents of efficient markets, explain that these anomalies are simply targeting higher risk and therefore achieving higher returns in the past. Now, in an efficient market, we expect that if someone is taking a higher risk, they should expect a higher return. So value portfolios, which are made up of stocks that are trading in a lower PE ratio or some other fundamental multiple, are likely to be riskier than growth or expensive stocks. Similarly, smaller stocks are potentially riskier than larger stocks. Now, subsequent research has found that there are some other factors, such as momentum and profitability. And by adding these other factors to the three-factor model, one can explain around 95% or even more of stock return movement. Additional research has identified other factor models as well that one can use to attempt to explain the cross-section of stock returns. So the natural next question becomes the following. Which factors are the most important? In other words, if the idea behind factor investing is to find what explains stock market returns, then it stands to reason that building concentrated portfolios of the highest returning factors has the potential to bring about market-beating results. In the book, Your Complete Guide to Factor-Based Investing, Larry Swedro and Andrew Birkin construct a wonderful framework to come up with a list of factors that are not just significant, but have either economic or behavioral reasoning that back them up so that they have the potential to continue working in the future. To come up with this list, Swedro and Birkin ask the following from each factor. One, is it persistent? Does it hold across long periods of time and different economic regimes? Two, is it pervasive? Does it hold across countries, regions, sectors, and even asset classes? Three, is it robust? Does it hold for various definitions, such as changing the valuation metric for the value factor? 
Four, is it investable? Does it hold up in real world and not just on paper? May I also dare to add, is it simple to implement? Five, is it intuitive? Is there a logical risk-based and or behavioral-based explanation for the premium and for why it should continue to exist? This narrowed down the so-called factor zoo to a smaller number of factors that are both significant and investable. And in the book, Swedra and Birkin narrowed down the list to the following. The market factor, or beta, size, value, momentum, quality or profitability, term, carry, low volatility, default or credit, and time series momentum, also known as trend following. And out of all of these, the market value and momentum factors have shown to have the largest premiums over the long term. Meaning that forming a stock portfolio of value and momentum stocks can theoretically bring about market beating results if these factors persist into the future. As empirical research has shown that both value and momentum have trounced the market at least historically. In other words, factor investing is not just another trendy way to invest for the cool kids in the block. There's actually a great amount of evidence supporting the idea that factors quote unquote work. So if they quote unquote work, why isn't everyone a factor investor? Well, the question one should really ask is who can be a factor investor? Factor portfolios tend to deviate from the overall market a lot and they can do so for very long periods of time. So that there must be some pain that investors must feel in exchange for higher expected returns. After all, these strategies need to be painful so that they're sustainable in the long run. Otherwise, everyone would be a factor investor. And when everyone is a factor investor, well, then no one is a factor investor. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe, and more importantly, share this video with a friend. Also, make sure to head to alfarchitect.com slash subscribe and there make sure to subscribe to the blog where you can find more educational resources like this one. I'm also going to link a blog post where we talk about Andrew Birkins and Larry Swedro's book. So make sure to check that out in the description. Lastly, make sure to follow me on TikTok at Coffee Hour with Jose. I'll see you next time.